Okay, so I'll be talking about quite a different topic now, um, Bayesian networks in Scala. Most of you probably haven't heard of Bayesian networks. They're even in the machine learning community not that well known. Oh, one, pe one person knows about them. Two, three, four, five, six, wow. Ever more uh, hands raising up. So uh, I wasn't expecting that, but uh, hopefully there's something for you in it as well. Um, my name is Martin Mauch. I work at an online marketing company called Creolytics. Uh, and uh, I'll be using a library that's called Base Scala, written by, um, by a Polish guy as well, uh, Daniel Korczekwa. And he's also been very helpful in answering my questions and, uh, and adding stuff to the presentation even. So um, this is the link to the project. I'll be uh, sending the link to my presentation on Twitter as well, so you can check out the slides afterwards. And in the speaker's notes, there are also additional information that you might want to have a look at. Um, yeah, my GitHub link, my company's GitHub link, and here my Twitter handle, Gimme Mo. So this, for some people, is their first uh, Bayesian network. What you see here is a directed acyclic graph of nodes. Uh, those nodes in blue are random variables. That is a variable whose uh, value deter uh, or, uh, depends on some kind of random process. And um, those nodes are linked by edges. Those ed edges uh, signify a conditional dependency between those. So that's a statistical term, and it's hard to uh, describe, uh, but you can just uh, imagine that as some kind of influence or causality. And um, in this example, this is the student example, very famous example. You have a student who has a certain intelligence. He wrote an SAT, that's the uh, American College Admission Test, and um, he also writes an exam with a certain difficulty and by, his, by the difficulty of, uh, of the exam and his intelligence, um, this yields a grade of the exam. And then uh, by that uh, grade, his professor writes a recommendation letter, which can be good or bad. So I haven't explained those tables yet. Those are the so-called conditional probability tables. In those tables, you have um, that, that might be a little bit hard to read, but you have one row for each possible state of that random variable. So here you have easy and hard. So exam can be easy and hard. Intelligence can be derp or smart. And in this example, uh, the numbers are quite uh, pessimistic. So there's 70% of derp people and only 30% smart people. Um, and the different columns are for um, are for the cross product of the node's parents' values. So let's start simple. Uh, in this intelligence node, this doesn't have any parents, so it only has one column. Uh, this column, probability, which tells you the absolute probability of being smart or being derp. Um, if you look at the grade, then here we've got excellent, average, and bad as possible states. And we have, for every combination of the parent nodes values, we have one column. So intelligence can be derp, and the difficulty of the exam can be easy. That's this column. And in, that, in those cells, you again have the probabilities that given intelligence is derp and difficulty is easy, then you've got a 0 0.3 uh, probability of getting an excellent grade in that exam. Um, yeah. On the right-hand side of, um, of the table is uh, this inferred column, and it doesn't actually belong to the conditional distribution table, but uh, it will contain the values that we're interested in. That's why I uh, put it at the right-hand side of the conditional probability table. So <clears throat> what's the deal? Why should you care about Bayesian networks? Um, Bayesian networks have some very desirable properties that you won't find in many other machine learning algorithms. For example, they perform well with uh, missing data and noise in both input and output. 
Um, so with other ma machine learning algorithms, with missing data, you have to apply some um, pre-processing, for example, interpolation to add those values, or you just throw out those rows altogether and lose some lose some possibly valuable uh, information. Um, Bayesian networks deal with that quite gracefully, and um, they also don't have so many degrees of freedom that they would uh, uh, overgeneralize as many other algorithms do. As you saw, they're quite visual. They're, uh, you can have a look at the network and easily grasp what it's what it's about and um, and the dependencies between the nodes and a domain expert can uh, can inspect for example those probability tables can check uh, do the values in there make sense and if they don't he can even just go ahead and fix those numbers and replace them by something that he considers more uh, appropriate also, they can handle a wide variety of questions, so um, we'll get into that later. And in most cases, they're computationally tractable and have even quite good runtimes uh, where other algor algorithms are uh, not working anymore. They also have some disadvantages. Um, I've ordered them in a timely manner, so when you start with them, uh, they can be quite overwhelming. They have a very special terminology that you'll be confronted with um, and also a lot of new concepts, but uh, after sti sticking with it for a while, you notice that the concepts actually aren't, aren't hard and um, they all make sense intuitively after, after you have grasped them. Um, another thing is that it's not always clear uh, how to model things. So um, one example is that you can have uh, Bayesian networks with only discrete values, like the example I showed in the beginning, where every uh, node just has like three, three possible values. But you can also have networks with, um, uh, with Gaussian distributions, for example. And it's not always clear when to use which and uh, which edges to put in. And uh, yeah, so uh, this takes some time and experience to figure out what's the best approach for which problem. Um, the commonly used variants also uh, can only model discrete and Gaussian distributions. So what do you do if you have a continuous random variable that is not Gaussian? Uh, well, you can either discretize it by binning, like saying from 0 to 10 is, is, my, is my value low, and from 10 to 20 it's mid, and from 20 to 100 it's high. Or you can try to apply some uh, function in a pre-processing step that transforms your, um, your initial value into something that might be normally distributed. So then you can apply the, uh, Gaussian, uh, the Gaussian distribution model as well. And um, there's a kind of net that, uh, that's called hybrid, new, uh, hybrid Bayesian networks uh, that allow for both discrete and uh, continuous variables. And unfortunately, there's only one uh, library currently that is able to handle real-world large-scale pro uh, problems, and that's uh, infer.net, which is not commercially available if you're outside Microsoft. Um, but Base Scala, for example, is well uh, well suited for um, problems that have either discrete or continuous values. So uh, just some examples where Bayesian networks are used. Um, healthcare, you can easily imagine a, a network where at the bottom you have symptoms of diseases, for example a cough or something like that, and, uh, and upper Further up in the in the graph, you have uh, the causes, the possible causes for that diseases. So different uh, for that symptoms. So different diseases, for example. Um, yeah, in marketing and retail, um, you could try to predict future sales or conversion rates with Bayesian networks. That's also what we are trying to do with it. Um, there are other companies. Amazon is using it for recommendations as well. Um, Link prediction, I won't go through all of those, uh, but there's a load. I'll mention the betting industry because that's quite interesting. Um, Daniel Kotsekwa, the author of Base Gala, is actually using that in his company Betfair, and they are using uh, Bayesian network to estimate for a certain 
person, for example, what, uh, what probability does he have of, uh, of winning a bet? So I'll explain the Bayes theorem shortly and visually because it's such an important uh, concept if you're dealing with any kind of Bayesian statistics. So in this example, we've got Mr. Caveman and Mr. Caveman has a belief. Uh, a belief is a hypothesis or a probability that you assign to a certain hypothesis. And in this case, he has the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis that there's deer around in the area and he assigns a 50% probability to that uh, hypothesis. Now he observes some deer tracks in the snow and what he does now is update uh, the, his belief, increase the probability for this hypothesis and, um, and yeah, he's now quite sure that there's D in this area. And in mathematical terms, and you'll be hearing those all the time if you do something with Bayesian statistics, uh, this is called the prior belief. The, the observation or in the formula you have the likelihood which is the probability to observe uh, the data given your hypothesis and in the denominator you have some normalization term which isn't too important and uh, this gives you the posterior probability um, and in formula the probability of your hypothesis times the probability that the data happens given your hypothesis divided by the probability of the data and this gives you your posterior, uh, so the probability of your hypothesis after observing the data. Um, yeah, this takes a while to sink in, but it's so important that I needed to mention it here. Um, yeah, let's switch over to a live example. Um, this example is the Monty Hall problem. Oh, yeah, okay, works like that. And that's like a hello world problem uh, for, for Bayesian networks. Um, so the situation is this, imagine you're in a game show, um, you're the guest, and uh, there are three doors. You pick one of those three, and behind one of those three doors is a car. After you pick your door, uh, the, moder uh, the, the game host um, as opens one door and um, and gives you the chance to switch to switch your choice. So you can either stick to the door you initially chose or you can take the other door. And just by a quick show of hands, who would stick with the original door? Okay, not so many. Who would switch doors? Wow, it seems you've all seen this problem before. So. Uh, this, to me, it, it was so counterintuitive and every time I try to explain it to someone, they, they just don't believe me. Uh, but what happens in fact, and this is what our Gaussian network will tell us, is that uh, you should change the door. So first, uh, I'll just shortly explain the code here. So this is, uh, this is code from uh, base Scala. And we're defining categori categoricals here that are uh, random variables that ter take a discrete set of values. In this case, um, these are the probabilities. So one third, one third, one third are the chances that the car is behind either of those doors. Uh, the guest chooses randomly as well. He doesn't have any prior clue. And now Monty, his categorical depends, and this is where the edges come from in the graph depends on the variable car door and guest door. So Monty cannot choose freely because he uh, doesn't want, he can't open the door of the guest and he also doesn't want to spoil uh, the attention and open the car door. So his choice depends on uh, both car door and guest door variable. And this is the conditional probability table given as a vector. And I've added some code here um, because um, because uh, base Scala will only take those will take those vectors and won't give them names for efficiency reasons, and I've just added the names and I've given the uh, the different values names as well, and this is the code to display the graph. 
So um, now let's set an observation on this graph. Uh, the guests, let's say he just he opens door one, which is um, which is the zero. So um, base gala is using indices. It doesn't talk about names of states, so you won't find easy or hard in there. It just says zero one. So zero is door one here, and I'll. Uh, execute that and update the graph. So now you see the guest uh, node has one green row, which is the choice of the guest. And also in the inferred column, you see that only this can be possible anymore. So only door one is possible, the others are grayed out, zero. And you also see that for the car, the probabilities didn't change at all. That's what we'd expect as well. If the guest chooses the door, the car doesn't move. And now comes the surprising thing. Um, let's let Monty open the door. And let's say uh, he opens door one without loss of generality. I could say he opens door two as well. Doesn't matter. And let's see what happens then. So this row becomes green. And ha let's have a look at the car. And in fact, the door where uh, that the guest chose now has only one third chance. And uh, the other door that uh, Monty offers to switch to uh, has two-thirds of probability. Okay, so far for a first example. Um, a Bayesian network goes through three phases in its life cycle. First, you have to uh, define the network structure. Uh, this can be done manually by a domain expert, so he could just say, okay, I know I've got these random variables and I know that there are these causal dependencies between those random variables. Um, there are also ways to learn the network structure from, uh, from data, uh, but this is well error prone and is a quite advanced feature and Base Scala also doesn't offer that functionality, so I won't be covering that here. Um, the second phase is assigning or learning parameters. Again, this can be done by a domain expert, so he can just uh, take the, uh, the probability tables and put in the numbers that he finds reasonable. Um, that this can also be combined with a later learning phase where you use, for example, a expectation maximization algorithm to update the probabilities uh, from your data. So that's a very nice property that you uh, that you start with expert or some prior assumptions and then learn the real or learn better probabilities from uh, your data. And then the third step, and that's what I'll be demoing, is inference, where you ask the system certain questions and it will give you answers. And this is also where Bayesian networks shine because they can answer much more uh, questions than usual machine learning algorithms. So what kind of questions can Bayesian networks answer? Um, the first one is prediction. So I want to know the probability of an effect, of an effect given that I know the causes. Um, diagnostic is the reverse. So I uh, I observe the I observe the effect or the symptoms, and I want to know where those uh, where those effects came from, what the causes were. Uh, classification is well known. You have uh, data and you want to assign uh, class probabilities to each of your data rows uh, given the features that you have in your data. And you can even use Bayesian networks for decision making where you estimate the probability of a certain utility function or a cost function uh, given that you make a change, for example, to your sales process or whatever. So now time for another demo. This time it will be the, uh, the student network again, and I hope this all fits on the screen. Yeah, almost. So let's first do a prediction. Given I am a student and I consider myself smart, I would like to know uh, what's the probability of getting a strong recommendation letter from my professor. So that's this row here. 
and I'll set the observation that I am smart. So I'll set intelligence to one. Graph should be updating in a second, unless it crashed. again. Okay, so for safety reasons I've prepared another graph down here. Hopefully this works. Okay, um, I have the possibility of switching over to my colleague's laptop, which I have here as a backup. <laughs> I was already considering the uh, possibility that this might happen, although it didn't happen uh, any time when I tried it out before. But as always, as soon as you're on stage, uh, things go awfully wrong. Um, Christoph, I can't leave the full screen mode. <laughs> Uh, looks like the backup wasn't so safe either. <laughs> I don't have a third one. I'll try to, yeah, I'll try to execute uh, the painting process again. Sorry for this, it really didn't happen before, uh, but hopefully we'll get this running within, the, within a second. You're just now switched, it's, right. it's already on. I switched the display already. Okay. It should be mirrored. Before it was full screen, we could see it. Okay, you could switch back to my screen as well, it's working again. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, I've set my intelligence to smart here. The line is green. And now we can see uh, previously the probability of getting a strong recommendation letter was something like 50%. Now as I'm a smart guy, I have a 76% uh, probability. Now I'm a little worried and uh, because the uh, the difficulty of the exam might actually be uh, harder or might be hard. So I'll set the difficulty of the exam as well. Let's see what happens now. Okay, difficulty is hard here. Uh, the, con uh, the conditional probabilities here have updated. You see that for grade only this column is available right now. And if I look at the letters, if at the recommendation letter, my, the probability for getting a strong recommendation letter went down to 63%. So uh, this is a demo of, what's, of what uh, we can predict downwards from causes to effects. Now let's take, um, let's take the opposite direction. Uh, different situations say we are an employer and uh, and a student applied for a job at our company and uh, we have, his, we have uh, the recommendation letter from his professor 
and we want to know is that guy really smart. Uh, come on, it's hiding there. <laughs> okay, uh, let's let's just ignore that node, and um, so we have the observation that the student got a strong recommendation letter from the professor. Let's check the probability. Okay, now w with 45% he's smart. Uh, that's still low and that's mainly because our population consists of mainly DERP uh, students. Um, let's see, we, uh, as an employer we try to gather some more information and from some source we get the score of his uh, SAT and let's see uh, what happens if he had a high score in the SAT as well. Okay, now he has a probability of 93% of being a smart person. So uh, this was uh, diagnostical or yeah, this was a diagnosis so we had the uh, we had the effects and from the effects we reasoned about the causes of those effects. Um, okay, and I'll just shortly tell you about uh, the algorithms that are used for this inference or I won't go into any details, I just want to give you a high level overview of the ups and downs of each version. So there's uh, the exact inference um, which will always get you the correct numbers but it can have potentially uh, exponential complexity in the number of nodes. So for practical, uh, for practical data sets, that's not really uh, an option often. So you'll mostly, uh, you'll mostly be using approximate inference and the most, uh, the most well-known algorithm is the so-called belief propagation. Um, the convergence here is not guaranteed, so this, in theory, or for certain types of uh, networks, this uh, algorithm might be stuck in, uh, in oscillations. Um, even if it doesn't oscillate, or even if it does converge, it is not guaranteed that it will converge to the correct value. But in practice, it turns out that this doesn't happen too often, so... Uh, Belief propagation is still the main algorithm that you'll be using when you use Bayesian networks. There are also sampling methods like uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, if you've heard of that. And those are like drawing random examples and the quality that you get in your results will depend on the number of samples you draw. So you can interrupt that process at any time um, and depending on how much time you gave it, you'll be getting better or worse results. And then there's the variational methods. Um, they are faster than the sampling methods, uh, but they are potentially biased, especially if you, have, uh, if you don't have so much data. Uh, they can give you wrong um, or partially wrong answers. So the state of the art is, uh, uh, is combining sampling methods with variational methods. That's where a lot of research is being done as well. Um, yeah, so that's mostly it. I just want to recommend you uh, some additional material if uh, you decide that uh, Bayesian networks are interesting for you. Um, actually, I would start with the tutorials from Bayesian Lab. Um, Bayesian Lab is a commercial Bayesian network software at a quite hefty price that not many of us will be able to afford. Uh, but they've got really nice introductory tutorials where you see what you can do with Bayesian networks and they also give you some tips on, uh, on how to approach certain problems. Then if you want to uh, dig a little deeper into the background and the mathematics of it, I can recommend the Coursera course uh, on probabilistic graphical models uh, by Daphne Koller. And if you're more into reading, there's a very good and tangible book, approachable book, uh, Modeling and Reasoning with Bayesian Networks. So, uh, yeah, I had the initial slide repeated here, so I'll put it on again. Thanks for your attention. I have one minute for any superficial question.